to have every one of you worshiping with us tonight. It's good just to come together and to worship the Lord. Beautiful songs, our worship team, we thank them, and uh, we thank you for coming. But we're doing a series called Christ, or Jesus Greater Than. Jesus is greater than, you name it. The cross is greater than everything. He's even greater than my voice tonight. And... Uh, in fact, he'll be so great, he'll carry us on until my voice stops, and then we'll, st we'll, we'll quit. Okay? That could be an hour and a half away. It could be five minutes. We don't know. But we'll just keep going until then. Heavenly Father, as we open your word now, we pray that your Holy Spirit will touch our hearts as only he can, the great teacher. Amen. Every so often, you'll see a number go up, and you can text in any question that you might have from this uh, chapter that we're looking at. And I'll do my best to answer those questions at the end of the service or on the website uh, during the week. Turn with me, please, to Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3. Chapter 1, Christ is greater than the angels. Chapter 2, we looked at Jesus, the great God-man, the, the high priest who took on a, the God who took upon himself a body so that he could die, so that he could be a sacrifice and a high priest. And the writer will expand on that in a lot more detail later on in the book. And tonight, greater than Moses. And so, dear brothers and sisters who belong to God and are partners with those called to heaven, think carefully about this Jesus, whom we declare to be God's messenger and high priest. He wants us to think carefully. It's a great chapter to think carefully about. This chapter and so many of the chapters in Hebrews are not easy chapters. They are actually some of the most difficult chapters in the Bible to understand, but we're going to go kind of verse by verse, just keep digging away at it and uh, see what we can garner from it. For he was faithful to God, who appointed him just as Moses served faithfully when he was entrusted with God's entire house, the entire Hebrew race. Moses. Was there a greater leader than Moses? The man who went back to Pharaoh and said, let God's people go. The man who brought the ten disasters down upon Egypt. The man who led them out of Egypt and across the Red Sea. The man who was the great lawgiver. God gave the law to him on Mount Sinai. The greatest leader in Israel's history. And he was considered, well, of any of any man, any leaders in their history, that which would be given highest esteem. In fact, there was a close to a, a veneration of him. And even such is not to be compared with Jesus. But Jesus deserves far more glory than Moses. How much glory? Well, just as a person who builds a house deserves more praise than the house itself. When you walk into a house, you, you don't really praise the house, you praise the one who built the house. So if Moses is the house, who's the builder? Jesus. In fact, he built everything. Every house has a builder, for one who built everything is God. Moses is the created. He's the creature. Jesus is the creator. Verse 5, Moses was certainly faithful in God's house as a servant. His work was an illustration of the truths God would reveal later, but Christ, as the Son, is in charge of the entire house. Moses is the servant in the house. Jesus is the owner of the house. He built it. He owns it. He's the son of the owner. It's, it's a family thing. Moses is there as he, well, in one sense he's the house, in another sense he's the servant who does the bidding of the owner. So Christ is so much greater then the second part of verse 6, and we are God's house if we keep our courage and remain confident in our hope in Christ. How do you know you're in God's house? If we're identified with Christ, if we belong to him, you are the house as well. How do you know that you're the house? Well, it says you keep your courage and remain confident in in your hope in Christ. Only those whose lives are consistent with what they profess have any claim to being God's house. This is a message that 
was so important for these early Hebrew Christians who were tending to become not only apathetic to what they've been called to, but were beginning to draw back. It's a message that is so important for the North American church today. Those who belong to Christ, are, their, their lives are consistent with what they profess. And the, one of the great themes of this book is a true Christian is one who perseveres. The family of God are those who persevere for God. Those of faith are those who persevere in their faith. And then he begins to quote from Psalm 95. This is why the Holy Spirit says, Today, when you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. What's it mean to harden your heart? To harden your heart is to develop a, a fixed attitude of rejection, of unbelief, a prolonged attitude of disobedience. And it doesn't happen suddenly. It happens over time, slowly but surely, a series of choices to ignore Christ, and the heart gets harder and harder and harder. It's like cement. When you pour cement, it's soft and you can move it around. But the longer you leave it, the harder it gets. And when it becomes hard, it's irreversible. Don't harden your hearts. As Israel did when they rebelled. And when they tested me in the wilderness. There your ancestor tested and tried my patience even though they saw my miracles for 40 years. Just think of it. Israel, they hardened their hearts despite opportunity, despite witnessing God's miracles, God's blessing, God's power over and over again, God's goodness over and over again. Think of it. They were there when the 10 disasters fell upon Egypt. They witnessed it all. When they came to the Red Sea, they saw that, <coughs> excuse me, that Red Sea open up in front of them, and they walked across on dry ground. You know, think of it. They get to the other side, and they, they witness God bring those waters back over the Egyptian cavalry. They get into the wilderness, and a, a cloud leads them by day, and a fire leads them by night. They are thirsty, and God brings water out of the rock. They are hungry, and God every day brings manna down from heaven whereby they can feed. They witnessed all of these things, miracle after miracle after miracle, for 40 years. Think of it, 40 years. Do you know how long it could have, should have taken them to go from Sinai up to the promised land? 11 days. Just 11 days but it took them 40 years to get where God wanted them to go. It says in verse 10, I was so angry with them, I said their hearts always turn away from me. They refuse to do what I tell them. This, this God who's speaking here, the God whose patience is higher than the heavens, whose love is, is greater than from east to west, whose forgiveness is there, he, is, he becomes angry at Israel's persistent refusal to listen and to obey, to believe. And so he says in verse 11, so in my anger I took an oath, they will never enter my place of rest. They'll never enter the promised land. They'll never enter my rest. Turn with me back to, to Numbers chapter 14. Numbers 14. <coughs> they come to Kadesh Barnea. They've been moving through the wilderness. And they come from Sinai, about 11 days up to Kadesh Barnea. They, Moses sends spies in to spy out the land. They come back with a report that it's the greatest land they've ever seen. And Moses says, so we did move forward. do we move forward now? And 10 of the spies said, no, because there are too many obstacles. There are, there are walled cities. There are, are giants in the land. We look like grasshoppers to them. You see, 
their perspective was so wrong. They should have said, we look like grasshoppers to them, but they look like grasshoppers to God, and our God is big enough. Let's go in now and take the land. And that's what Caleb and Joshua said. But the other 10 said, no. They said, we can't do it. Our God is not big enough. And so what happened? They took a vote, and the majority, of the two, half, two and a half million to three, not to do it. Can the majority be wrong? Absolutely. And so they marched right up to the promised land and then they turned away. They turned back. God says in verse, chapter 14, verses 21 and 22, but as surely as I live and as surely as the earth is filled with the Lord's glory, not one of these people will ever enter that land. They have all seen my glorious presence and the miraculous signs I performed both in Egypt and in the wilderness, but again and again they have tested me by refusing to listen to my voice. I suppose they could have said, well, we're Hebrews. God's not going to let us go. He's not going to reject us. Like later on when the Babylonians were attacking, what was the argument they gave? They said, we're Hebrews. We have the temple here. God's not, not going to allow the Babylonians to destroy us as long as the temple's here and, and we're his people. You see, they were relying on their birth. They were relying on their name. And they thought they were God's people. And they weren't. And the same can, thing can be true of us today. We go through life thinking we're safe, thinking we're believers. We are churchgoers. But a church-going person doesn't necessarily at all, can, cannot say at all that they're a Christian. They're just a church-going person. Are you a believer? What kept these people out? Yes, they had the right name. They had the right pedigree. It was unbelief that kept them out. And that's what it says over in, in Hebrews chapter, um, chapter 3, verse 19. So we see that because of their unbelief, they were not able to enter his rest. Unbelief rejection despite continued opportunity and miracles people who have everything God shows himself to them in amazing ways and they know the truth and they still reject it and God turns them away is that the unpardonable sin I wonder Turn back with me to um, Mark chapter 3. We often hear this, this phrase, the unpardonable sin. What, what is the unpardonable sin? Do Christians commit it? Can a Christian commit the unpardonable sin? Or is it only unbelievers? What, what is it? You'll notice in Mark chapter 3, Jesus had just cast out a demonic spirit out of a man, which he'd done many times. He had raised the dead. He had healed the blind. He had healed the lame all claiming to do it in the name of his father. And the crowds, they, they looked at what Jesus had done and they said, surely this one must be the Messiah. And then it says the religious leaders who should have known better. And in fact, they did know better. You know how I know they knew better? Because one day, one of them, one of their own group, Nicodemus, came to Jesus and he said, we know that you are from God. Because nobody can do these miracles that you do except God be with him. So they knew who Jesus was. They recognized that God was with him. And yet they, they said that this man does these things in the name of Satan. Wow. People who should have known better. People who did know better. But persistently rejected Jesus. And finally crucified him. And Jesus said in, in response to this, verse 28 of chapter 3, I tell you the truth, all sin and blasphemy can be forgiven. But anyone who blasphemes the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. This is a sin with eternal consequences. He told them this because they were saying he possessed an evil spirit. I believe that the unpardonable sin is persistent rejection of the work of the Holy Spirit. Work that is clearly the power of the Holy Spirit. They know God is convicting them. They know God is drawing them. These are not believers. 
These are unbelievers who know the Spirit's work, they see the Spirit's work, they feel the Spirit's conviction, and they stubbornly disbelieve despite all the evidence. And you know what? Continued rejection of the Holy Spirit results in rejection by the Holy Spirit. And if the Holy Spirit ceases to convict you of sin and of righteousness and judgment, you'll never get saved. The only way we are saved is because the Holy Spirit convicts us and draws us to the Savior. If he stops doing that, you can't ever be saved. And these Pharisees were in that situation. You say, well, who in our midst is in that situation? Well, we don't know. Only Jesus knew that. So you don't stop praying for somebody. You don't start witnessing to somebody. You don't start working in their life as best you can because we don't know. Only God knows that there comes a point in someone's life who they persistently disregard him and God says, okay, you're on your own. And as soon as the Holy Spirit withdraws, there's no opportunity to be saved. I believe that's the unpardonable sin. And back in Hebrews chapter 3, I believe this is a, a sin that the Israelites had, had done. They said, we're not going into the land. God said, okay, you go back into the wilderness. And it's interesting, when they realized what had happened, they said, oh, no, no, we want to change our mind. We're going to go in if we can now. And so God said, well, if you do, I'm not with you. You see, you have rejected me persistently. Now I reject you. I'm not going with you. So they did try an attack and they got demolished. That army got destroyed because God was not with them. He had rejected them. And this is a, a severe warning here. Verse 12, then be careful, dear brothers and sisters. Make sure that your own hearts are not evil and unbelieving, turning you away from the living God. Beware lest the Holy Spirit bring, has brought you right up to the promised land, right up to the place of rest, which we'll see in the book of Hebrews, the place of rest in the Old Testament was the promised land. In the New Testament, it's the place of salvation. The place of God's rest brings you right up to it and you turn away and you fall back. Continued, persistent refusal to believe. And again, the rejection of the Holy Spirit results in the rejection by the Holy Spirit. So this is a personal warning. This is not something that I use to warn somebody else. I don't know what your heart is or someone else's heart is. I have to examine my own heart. And it says here, don't mess with the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Don't mess with the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Because there can be dangerous consequences. Verse 13, you must warn each other every day while it is still today so that none of you will be deceived by sin and hardened against God. We need to warn each other to be ready for that day. That's what Caleb did to the Israelite Hebrews. That's what jo Joshua did. It didn't do anything, but they were still there to warn. And we are to be Joshua's and we are to be Caleb's warning one another of the judgment of God to come and the need to receive Christ. But he's saying, examine your life, examine the choices that you make, lest you be deceived by the sin of unbelief that I belong to Jesus, I belong to the family of God, when in reality, I don't. That's why I think this is a huge, this is a, a, a significant message for the church in North America today. Because I think our churches are filled with people that believe they're going to heaven because they go to church every Sunday. And going to church will never get you into heaven. In fact, it seems to say here that if you're becoming more and more used to the message and more and more rejecting it, going to church can be a bad thing. Because you become hardened to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And so we need to examine our hearts. Do you belong to Christ? Verse 14, in closing, gives us two evidence here. For if we are faithful to the end, trusting God just as firmly as when we first believed, we will share in all that belongs to Christ. Are you in the family of God? 
Do you belong to him? First evidence here, you're faithful to the end. You endure. When you fall down and we all fail and fall, you get back up and keep going. When you sin, you confess. A couple of weeks ago, we were talking about the word hupamane. Steadfast endurance is what you need. And that's the verse that he'll use a lot in this book later on. When you fall down, you get back up and you keep going. That's a believer. It doesn't mean we're perfect. It means we are endurers through our imperfections. David was called the man after God's own heart. Why? Because he was such a great guy? No, he wasn't perfect in any way. He was failing over and over and over again. But he was a man who had a heart that was so tender toward God that whenever he failed God, he knew where to run. And that was he ran for mercy to his God. Whereas King Saul also failed and wouldn't run to God. There's the difference. King Saul knew the truth and he still rejected. David knew the truth and he failed, but he accepted and he endured in the way God wanted him to go. And the second evidence here is that you trust God. You trust God as when you first believed. There's that childlike faith that you had at the very beginning. Remember when you were saved? That childlike trust. That will persevere. It's not a perfect faith. But it's an enduring faith. And that's how you know you're a child of God. Any questions that have, have come in? I know we've opened a lot of subjects there in this message. A hardened heart is like cement, yes, but why can't it be unhardened? Where is, where is hope if the possibility of God's miracles cannot be changed or moved? Or where is hope if the possibility of God's miracles cannot be changed? I'm thinking you maybe mean that his miracles can't change a hardened heart. Well, the thing we have to be careful of is here, we don't know when a heart has become so hard it can't be changed. I mean, you would have think that Saul of Tarsus had a heart that was so hardened it could never be changed. But God knew differently. And God radically changed that man. But the Bible does teach. Nonetheless, and I think this is what the pardonable sin is, that an unbeliever can have so much rejection. And Israel was in that point. It says that Jesus spoke in parables so that those whose hearts were hardened would remain hardened. But that doesn't mean he closed off the gospel because those whose hearts were even a little bit soft came to him and said, what does that mean? And he said, I'll tell you what it means. He opened the gospel to them. Those whose hearts were already hardened had no interest in knowing. In fact, their interest was in getting him crucified as quickly as possible. I think Judas Iscariot was another one. He had the same opportunity as the rest of the disciples. His heart seemed to be soft. When Jesus said, one of you will betray me, nobody suspected Judas. But we read that Judas was so hardened that even in the face of the cross and at the Lord's table, he still went out and did what he did. His heart was hardened. And so, there is a situation, and I have no idea how often it happens, whereby people or groups of people can become so hardened that the Holy Spirit withdraws himself. But you and I, we never know who that is or where that point is. And so you see that the lesson here is not to say, well, I think his heart is so hard, I think we can just stop praying for him. No, it's a self-examination. It's to ask yourself, am I truly a believer or is my heart hardening? It's a, it's a warning not to let your heart get to the point where it's hard. It's a warning that if God is convicting you at all, that's proof that your heart isn't hard. He's convicting you. Respond. And don't continue to reject. That's the warning. I hope that answers. It's a tough issue, I know. And, um, but there it is. Any other questions? No questions, all right. Let us stand and we'll continue in worship. Father, we... Thank you for these words, Father. Your, your word is, is truth. It's not always easy to understand. But Father, it is truth. And may we receive not only the encouragement, 
but may we receive the warnings of your word, Father, not to reject you, Lord Jesus, not to reject your son, not to ignore his words, not to walk away from you, but Lord, to listen to you, to believe you, and to obey you. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. That his love can reach there's no place where we can find peace there's no to amazing grace take me in with your arms spread wide take me in like an orphan child never let go never leave my side I am holding on to you I am holding on to you in the middle of the storm I am holding on I am love like this oh my God to find I am overwhelmed with the joy divine. Love like this sets our hearts on fire. I storms sometimes we're the ones in it and we need other people other times you know of people that are in storms and we can be that reminder to them that Jesus is greater and direct them to his scriptures and to encourage and build one another up so we encourage you to take these words home with you 
and uh, to read through Hebrews uh, during these next months as we're studying it. Just make it uh, part of your, your routine. It's almost like uh, feeding on it, where it nourishes your, your soul and your heart so it doesn't become hard. Uh, as we send you out this evening, we want to encourage you out in the foyer to grab, because it's Valentine's Day, to grab a heart. You'll see them hanging over the coat racks, and Sherry tells us that you can grab those and they actually come off. And what you'll see on the back is a name. And this is one of the names of the kids that are in our Kids Rock program here. And we're asking that you will, you'll love them before the Lord, that you'll pray for them until Easter. So to, to be encouraged to do that as a step of love, uh, take one of our kids home with you. It's just their first name. You may not know who they are, but it'll, it'll tell you their age and their first name. Hold them up before the Lord as they hear God's word and they grow. It's very important as young children to hear the truth of the gospel, and we want to pray for them to do that. So we encourage you to do that, okay? Well, you are dismissed and you are blessed. So as you leave tonight, go in both the power and the peace of the Holy Spirit. Amen.